was replaced with an updated compilation of articles entitled Shepherd the Flock of God, which is now the primary text from which an elder takes guidance on his congregation. <coughs> Additional information in support of the Jehovah's Witness Church's theocratic policies is made available to congregation members through the Watchtower and Awake magazines and other publications. Rodney Spinks of the Service Department will give evidence that the current policies of the Jehovah's Witness Church for dealing with an accusation of child sexual abuse are outlined in the following four publications. Firstly, the Bible. The English edition is the New World Translation of the Holy Scriptures. Secondly, the Elder's Handbook. Thirdly, Watchtower Society publications such as Organized to Do Jehovah's Will. And fourthly, letters sent to all bodies of elders, in particular a letter dated 1 October 2012 which consolidated and, re and replaced into one letter the spiritual advice and guidance provided in various past letters from preceding years as to how Jehovah's Witnesses handle allegations of child sexual abuse. Evidence will be put before the Royal Commission that the current policies and procedures relating to child sexual abuse within the Jehovah's Witness Church are supplemented, in particular, by the following material. First, a pivotal Watchtower article entitled Let Us Abhor What is Wicked, published in January 1997, which clarified in biblical terms the principles to which a congregation should have regard in considering how a child molester should be viewed and treated. And secondly, updated guidelines issued by the governing body to all branch officers in August 2013 regarding how service desks should field questions from elders regarding child abuse matters. Elders within the Jehovah's Witness Church are given periodic training on the implementation of its policies and procedures. The training takes the form of one-day programs or seminars called Kingdom Ministry Schools. There will be evidence regarding the established disciplinary procedure adopted by the church for responding to allegations of child sexual abuse in Australia. Documents will be tendered and evidence given showing that the Jehovah's Witness Church considers that it is only authorized to address child sexual abuse in accordance with scriptural direction. The Jehovah's Witness Church recognizes child abuse to be a gross sin and crime. Its official position is that they abhor child sexual abuse and will not protect any perpetrator of such repugnant acts. Child sexual abuse is defined by the Jehovah's Witness Church as follows. Child sexual abuse generally includes sexual intercourse with a minor, oral or anal sex with a minor, fondling the genitals, breasts or buttocks of a minor, voyeurism of a minor, indecent exposure to a minor, soliciting a minor for sexual conduct, or any kind of involvement with child pornography. Depending on the circumstances of the, of the case, it may also include sexting with a minor. Sexting describes the sending of nude photos, semi-nude photos, or sexually explicit text messages electronically, such as by phone. According to the Jehovah's Witness Church, child sexual abuse is captured by the scriptural offenses, firstly, pornea, which is immoral use of the genitals between two people, and secondly, brazen or loose conduct, which includes fondling of breasts, explicitly immoral proposals, showing pornography to a child, voyeurism, indecent exposure, and thirdly, gross uncleanliness, which is heavy petting. Jehovah's Witnesses are taught from the Bible that they have a personal responsibility to report wrongdoing to elders. If the wrongdoer does not voluntarily come forward, Upon receipt of an allegation, elders are directed to immediately call the branch office for direction based on the circumstances of each case. Two elders from the congregation are also directed to immediately call the legal department for legal advice on mandatory reporting obligations. The legal department is instructed to refer the elders to the service department for scriptural direction on theocratic or judicial aspects of the case and how to spiritually comfort and support the victim. The service department also provides guidance on when and how elders should interview a young victim of child abuse. Two elders are directed to investigate every allegation of child sexual abuse by speaking with the victim, the alleged offender, and any other witnesses if necessary. 
The weight given to the testimony of youths is at the discretion of the investigating elders. Elders are not authorized to take congregational action unless the child sexual abuse is proven according to biblical standards, which are satisfied by evidence of a confession from the accused or the testimony of two credible witnesses to the same incident or the testimony of two witnesses to separate incidents of the same kind of wrongdoing or strong circumstantial evidence testified to by at least two witnesses. Whereby those rules, there is insufficient evidence to substantiate the alleged child sexual abuse. The matter is held in abeyance and the elders are directed to, quote, remain vigilant with regard to the conduct and activity of the accused. In this event, no further action is taken in relation to the complaint and the matter is left in Jehovah's hands. If sufficient evidence is discovered, the elders must determine whether a judicial committee should be appointed to give scriptural discipline to the wrongdoer. Child sexual abuse is recognized as an offense for which a judicial committee should be formed. The Royal Commission will hear that over the past 65 years, the requirement that there be two or more witnesses has prevented at least 125 allegations of child sexual abuse from proceeding to a judicial committee. That is not unexpected, given that by its nature, there are very seldom witnesses to child sexual abuse beyond the survivor and the perpetrator. The Judicial Committee is comprised of three or more elders to determine, firstly, if the individual is guilty of violating God's laws, and secondly, whether the individual is genuinely repentant. Repentant involves a deep regret over a damaged relationship with Jehovah remorse over the reproach brought upon Jehovah's name, and a severe longing to come back into God's favor. Documents will be tendered which show that the Jehovah's Witnesses consider that the degree of repentance ought to be commensurate with the degree of deviation. The Royal Commission will hear that since 1950, 563 alleged perpetrators of child sexual abuse were the subject of a Judicial Committee hearing. The Judicial Committee has wide-ranging sanctions available to it to deal with proven wrongdoing. If the wrongdoer is unrepentant, he is to be disfellowshipped from the congregation. To be disfellowshipped means to be excommunicated from or cast out of the Jehovah's Witness Church. Congregation members are directed not to associate with disfellowshipped persons. Disfellowshipping differs from disassociation which is an action taken by an individual who no longer wants to be known as a Jehovah's Witness. If the wrongdoer is judged to be genuinely repentant, the sanction is to administer reproof of the wrongdoer. <coughs> Reproval may be public or private, and is a lesser form of discipline that allows the wrongdoer to remain a member of the congregation. Public reproval is administered before onlookers and serves to discipline the wrongdoer whilst warning the congregation that wrongdoing has been committed. Private reproval involves telling the accused that he is reproved before only those aware of the wrongdoing. A person who is judicially reproved is disqualified from special privileges, such as serving in a position of authority. Judicial restrictions are also imposed on those who are reproved. The restrictions might include being counseled by the elders about appropriate behavior with children. A public announcement is made to the congregation regarding the fact, but not the grounds, of disfellowshipping or reproval. The Royal Commission will hear that since 1950, 401 alleged perpetrators of child sexual abuse were disfellowshipped, 78 of whom were disfellowshipped on more than one occasion and 190 alleged perpetrators of child sexual abuse were approved, 11 of whom were approved on more than one occasion. Disfellowshipping decisions may be appealed within seven days. Appeal committees are formed, even if there seems to be no valid basis for it, comprising, to the extent possible, impartial elders from a different congregation who hear the case ab initio. A disfellowship person may be reinstated into the congregation after the passage of sufficient time if the Judicial Committee determines that the individual is truly repentant and the reasons for their removal from the congregation have been abandoned. 
In all cases of reinstatement, documents will be tendered which show that congregational restrictions should be applied. Since 1950, of 401 disfellowshipped alleged perpetrators of child sexual abuse, 230 were later reinstated, 35 of whom were reinstated on more than one occasion. The case study will explore a number of risk management measures that the Jehovah's Witness Church has in place regarding how a congregation might deal with a person against whom an ac accusation of child molestation has been made. Mr. O'Brien will give evidence that the Jehovah's Witness Church believes that loving and protective parents are the best deterrent to child abuse. Mr. O'Brien's evidence will be that it is the position of the Jehovah's Witness Church that parental education of children about sex and the dangers of child sexual abuse can be a major factor in its prevention. He will say that the Jehovah's Witness Church continues to educate parents via study groups and publications to help protect their children from child sexual abuse. Documents will be tendered which show that the Jehovah's Witness Church considers the primary responsibility for the protection of children lies with parents. Mr. O'Brien will say that this is particularly so as the Jehovah's Witness Church does not have programs or facilities that separate children from their parents such as schools or Sunday schools and so on. Mr. O'Brien will give evidence that elders are directed to report allegations of child abuse to authorities where mandatory reporting laws apply. The Royal Commission will hear evidence from Vincent Toole of the legal department of his understanding of the various mandatory reporting obligations that apply across Australian states. Documents will be tendered which show that if no mandatory reporting obligations apply, elders are directed that they do not themselves need to report. The evidence will show that where a matter becomes known to the authorities, elders are directed to disclose information in their possession where legally required to do so, unless ecclesiastical privilege applies. The Royal Commission will hear evidence that elders are directed never to discourage or sanction anyone from reporting an allegation of child sexual abuse to the authorities, and that if asked, they must make clear that this is a personal decision and a victim's absolute right. The Royal Commission will hear evidence from at least one survivor witness who, contrary to this policy, was discouraged from reporting her abuse to secular authorities by elders in the Jehovah's Witness Church. Documents will be tendered which show this is consistent with the Jehovah's Witnesses policy not to resort to secular courts to resolve personal disputes with fellow Christians but to rely on the elders. Evidence will be put before the Royal Commission that of the 1,006 alleged perpetrators of child sexual abuse identified by the Jehovah's Witness Church since 1950, not one was reported by the Church to secular authorities. This suggests that it is the practice of the Jehovah's Witness Church to retain information regarding child sexual abuse offences but not to report allegations of child sexual abuse to the police or other relevant authorities. This case study will consider whether the practice of the Jehovah's Witnesses Church of not reporting allegations of child sexual abuse to secular authorities <coughs> potentially exposes members of the church to criminal liability for concealment of serious and indictable offences under Section 316 of the Crimes Act of 1900 in New South Wales and failure to disclose sexual offences against minors under Section 327 of the Crimes Act 1958 of the State of Victoria. The case study will consider the interaction of these offences with the confessional privilege provided for in Section 127 of the Evidence Act of 1995 of the Commonwealth and replicated legislation in force in New South Wales, Victoria, Tasmania and the Northern Territory. It is anticipated that documents will be tendered before the Royal Commission, which will show that the Australia branch office have considered that confessional privilege would apply in circumstances where the perpetrator confessed to a child sexual abuse. The Royal Commission will hear evidence of the circumstances in which confessions relating to child sexual abuse are made to elders within a congregation and documents recording the circumstances of such confessions then provided to the branch office. 
Mr. O'Brien will say that the Jehovah's Witness Church complies fully with legislative requirements to ensure all relevant persons have the necessary clearances for working with children. Mr. Toole will give evidence that there are approximately 7,000 elders and ministerial servants currently serving in Jehovah's Witnesses congregations in Australia who have obtained child-related police checks. The Jehovah's Witness Church offers theocratic guidance on the sharing of information between relevant bodies of elders through letters of introduction when a member moves from one congregation to another. When a known child molester moves to another congregation, elders are instructed to send a letter of introduction with full and complete information about the person's background and current situation to the elders of the new congregation. Where an accused does not classify as a known child molester because there was an allegation of child abuse, but this was not scripturally proven, the branch office determines what information regarding the accusation may be shared with the new congregation. Where a disfellowship person moves to a new congregation before applying for reinstatement, the new elders are directed to seek relevant information from the old congregation to determine genuine repentance for the purposes of any reinstatement application. The Royal Commission will hear evidence that elders and ministerial servants hold positions of trust within the congregations. The Jehovah's Witness Church offers theocratic guidance on the qualification of a known child molester for such positions of responsibility. Mr. Spinks will give evidence that an, that an elder or ministerial servant is immediately removed if he is found to have engaged in child sexual abuse. Documents will be tendered at the hearing which show that elders are instructed to allow considerable time to pass before extending privileges of service to a former child abuser. Since 1950, 28 alleged perpetrators of child sexual abuse were appointed to positions of authority after having been the subject of allegations of child sexual abuse. Further, of 127 alleged perpetrators of child sexual abuse deleted as elders or ministerial servants as a result of allegations of child sexual abuse, 16 were later reappointed. In September 2014, the Jehovah's Witness Church revised its screening process for appointments to elder or ministerial positions. The current procedure requires the nominee to pass the service department's check for anything that may disqualify the individual from appointment and to answer certain questions regarding whether he has ever been involved with child sexual molestation. Mr. Toole will give evidence regarding the document retention policies of the Jehovah's Witness Church in relation to records of child sexual abuse. The current policy provides that records concerning an individual accused of child molestation are to be indefinitely retained in the congregational confidential file. The Royal Commission will hear evidence that this has been a long-standing practice of the Jehovah's Witness Church. The Royal Commission has been contacted by 57 persons about child sexual abuse in the Jehovah's Witness Church. Of these, 34 are themselves survivors of child sexual abuse in the church. The Royal Commission will hear evidence from two women, each of whom was sexually abused as a child in the Jehovah's Witness Church. Their cases are considered to be the most appropriate for the purposes of this case study. They are expected to testify about their, their experiences of growing up as a Jehovah's Witness, being sexually abused by Jehovah's Witnesses who were in positions of authority, being discouraged from dis associating with non-Jehovah's Witnesses, the distress they experienced throughout the Judicial Committee hearing process, which involved being interviewed by a panel of males without any support, the blame that each accused sought to place on them as survivors, the absence of an explained purpose to the meetings and interviews to which they were subjected, and being discouraged from approaching authorities. The Royal Commission will hear from both survivors that the impact of the child sexual abuse and the response of the Jehovah's Witness Church is ongoing. <coughs> I'll summarize first the case of BCB and then the case of BCG. A person given the pseudonym BCB began associating with Jehovah's Witnesses Church when she was 10 years old 
and was formally baptized as a Jehovah's Witness at age 18. Between 1980 and 1986, BCB regularly stayed overnight at the house of the Neal family, of whom the father was Bill Neal, one of two elders in the Narragan congregation in Western Australia. BCB's evidence will be that she attended weekly Bible studies led by Bill Neal at the Narragan Kingdom Hall and at Mr. Neal's house. From 15 years of age, BCB was groomed and sexually abused by Mr. Neal. BCB's evidence will be that Bill Neal remained a respected elder within the congregation whilst he continued to abuse BCB. Notwithstanding this abuse, it will be BCB's evidence that she continued to respect Mr. Neal and felt unable to disclose the abuse because of his position. It will be BCB's evidence that in about 1991 she disclosed Mr. Neal's abuse to a Jehovah's Witness acquaintance. Thereafter, the other elder in the congregation, Max Hawley, approached BCB about Mr. Neal's conduct. Mr. Hawley then arranged a meeting with Bill Neal, BCB, and BCB's husband. The Royal Commission will hear that during this meeting, BCB endured Bill Neal making inappropriate jokes about his conduct that was the subject of the meeting. It will be BCB's evidence that having to discuss her abuse in front of a room full of men, including the perpetrator, was very distressing. The Royal Commission will hear that BCB felt unable to report the full extent of Bill Neal's abuse at the meeting. Max Hawley organized the second meeting, which was attended by BCB, BCB's husband, Bill Neal, and Doug Jackson, who was the circuit overseer for the Narragan congregation. During this meeting, Bill Neal lacked remorse and sought to blame BCB for wearing revealing clothing. It was BCB's evidence that, sorry, it will be BCB's evidence that at both meetings she felt unsafe and uncomfortable, disclosing the full extent of Bill Neal's abuse. Further, BCB's evidence will be that neither the purpose nor the outcome of the meetings was ever explained to her by the elders. The Royal Commission will hear evidence that following the committee meeting, Max Hawley discouraged BCB from further disclosures of abuse, quote, out of respect for the Neal flam family. BCB's evidence will be that she was left feeling unsupported by the congregation and was instead encouraged to respect her abuser. The Royal Commission will hear that Bill Neal stepped down as an elder, but that the grounds were not announced to the congregation. Notwithstanding abuse by Bill Neal, the Royal Commission will hear that BCB was still expected to attend Bible studies held at the Neal's house and continued to see Bill Neal several times a week at congregational meetings. The Royal Commission will hear that Bill Neal may have later been reappointed as an elder. BCB will give evidence that in about July 2014, after she had indicated that she was considering reporting her abuse to the Royal Commission, Joe Bellow, an elder in her congregation at the time, asked if BCB, quote, really wants to drag Jehovah's name through the mud. The commission will hear evidence that BCB felt brainwashed into believing that speaking with worldly people would bring reproach upon Jehovah's name. BCB's evidence will be that, by reporting her story, she is riddled with guilt for betraying the Jehovah's Witness Church. The Royal Commission will hear from three elders regarding their role in handling BCB's allegation of abuse against Bill Neal. Max Hawley served as an elder in the Narragan congregation from 1988. He will give evidence regarding his involvement in handling BCB's allegations of child sexual abuse by Bill Neal made in about 1991. Mr. Hawley's evidence will be that in circumstances where Bill Neal denied any intentional conduct, the rule requiring two or more witnesses meant that BCB's allegations could not be proven according to the scriptures. Ultimately, Bill Neal's removal as an elder was recommended by Mr. Hawley and Mr. Jackson because BCB's allegations had cast a cloud over Bill Neal's qualifications. Following Bill Neal's removal, he continued to attend meetings and was not placed on any specific restrictions. Documents will be tendered which show that the elders considered the spirituality and the seductiveness of the complainant in determining the complaint. Doug Jackson served as a circuit overseer in Western Australia between 1990 and 1998. 
The Royal Commission will hear evidence regarding Mr Jackson's involvement in the Judicial Committee hearing into the allegations against Bill Neal during his visit to the Narragan congregation in early 1992. Mr Jackson will give evidence regarding his recommendation that Bill Neal no longer met the scriptural qualifications for serving as an elder. Notwithstanding Bill Neal's admission to improper conduct, a document will be tendered which shows that in the same letter that recommends his removal as an elder, Mr Jackson recommends that Bill Neal be reappointed, quote, once this has died down and it appears that Brother Neal again has the freedom of speech. Joe Bellow has served as an elder since 1991. The Royal Commission will hear evidence regarding Mr Bellow's involvement in providing shepherding care and assistance to BCB during visits to her family in 2012, following BCB's disclosure of Bill Neal's abuse. Mr Bellow will give evidence that he did not intend to discourage BCB from approaching the Royal Commission. A person given the pseudonym BCG was baptized as a Jehovah's Witness when she was about 16 years old. The Royal Commission will hear evidence of BCG's experience growing up in a strict Jehovah's Witness family. BCG will give evidence that her father, BCH, was a highly regarded Jehovah's Witness who was appointed as a ministerial servant in the Mariba congregation in far north Queensland in about 1984. BCG's evidence will be that her father was influential within the congregation because he was well respected amongst members. As head of the household, BCH dictated and enforced compliance with household rules. BCG was not permitted to associate with anybody outside the Jehovah's Witness community and was taught from a young age that worldly people could not be trusted. BCG was not permitted by her parents to attend school after year 10 because choosing higher education over Jehovah was frowned upon by the Jehovah's Witness Church. When she was 17, BCG was sexually abused by her father on a number of occasions over a two-week period whilst her mother and siblings were away. BCG tried to report her father's abuse to two elders within the Mariba congregation, both of whom were friends of her father. BCG will give evidence that both elders refused to speak with BCG without her father being present. It was not until BCG found the courage to tell a male friend who approached BCG's father and the elders that the matter was investigated by the elders. BCG was interviewed by three elders, all friends of her father, on a number of occasions. On each occasion, BCG was alone without any support, and on one occasion, her father was also present. BCG's evidence will be that, instead of being protected and supported as a victim, the elders primarily sat in judgment of her credibility as a witness and made her feel to blame. BCG will give evidence that the elders forced her to directly confront her father with her abuse allegations. Her father's response was to threaten BCG and to blame her for seducing him. The Royal Commission will hear that when BCG disclosed the abuse to her mother, her mother advised that her father had previously abused BCG's older sister. At around the same time, BCG's two younger sisters confirmed that they were also victims of their father's abuse. The Royal Commission will hear that although the elders were advised of the additional victims, they did not take them into consideration in their investigation. BCG's father was ultimately disfellowshipped, not for his sexual abuse of BCG, but for unrelated, as it's put, loose conduct and lying. BCG will give evidence that the elders would not consider the evidence of her sister's abuse because they were, what, were not witnesses to the same event. BCG was devastated that her father's sexual abuse did not appear to qualify as wrongdoing in the eyes of the Jehovah's Witness Church. BCG's father immediately appealed his disfellowshipping. BCG was before, brought before an appeal committee alone to be interviewed again about the abuse. It was at this time that her father admitted the abuse and his disfellowshipping was upheld with grounds of pornea added. The Royal Commission will hear that BCG's father was reinstated after only a few years. BCG will testify that she was concerned for the safety of the congregation, but was discouraged from reporting to the police and was herself threatened with disfellowship. In December 1995, BCG wrote to Watchtower Australia regarding her father's premature reinstatement. Watchtower Australia responded in February 96 
<clears throat> by counseling faith in Jehovah and advising that it would make inquiries into the matters raised. The Royal Commission will hear that when BCG eventually left the Jehovah's Witness Church, she was completely ostracized by members of her local congregation. BCG then reported her father's abuse to the police. BCG's father, BCH, was ultimately convicted in 2004 for unlawful and indecent assault and attempted rape of BCG and sentenced to three years imprisonment. BCG's evidence will be that her experience of three criminal trials was easy compared to her experience of sitting through the Judicial and Appeal Committee meetings. The Royal Commission will hear evidence from the three elders of the Mariba congregation, that's Dino Ali, Ronald DeRoy, and Kevin Bowditch, regarding their role in handling BCG's allegations of abuse by her father that she reported in about May 1989. Dino Ali and Ronald DeRoy will give evidence that, in circumstances where BCH denied the allegations, the Judicial Committee was bound by the rule requiring two or more witnesses and did not have sufficient proof of the child sexual abuse to take judicial action. It was for this reason the Royal Commission will hear that BCH was ultimately disfellowshipped, not for child sexual abuse, but for loose conduct and for lying to the elders about his conduct. Ronald DeRoy and Kevin Bowditch will give evidence that it was not until BCH confessed to the sexual abuse of BCG during the appeal committee hearing in 1989 that the grounds for BCH's disfellowshipping were extended to include his sexual abuse of BCG. In 1990, BCH applied to the Beanley East Congregation for reinstatement. The Royal Commission will hear that Rodney Spinks and Monty Baker, both elders in the Beanley East Congregation at that time, regarding their involvement on the Judicial Committee appointed to consider BCH's reinstatement application. Rodney Spinks will give evidence of BCH's reinstatement, sorry, give evidence that BCH's reinstatement application was rejected because he did not display genuine repentance. Mr. Baker will give evidence regarding the process of liaising with the Mariba congregation, which was responsible for the decision to disfellowship BCH to obtain relevant information to assess BCH's reinstatement application. Alan Penchef was an elder of the Logan Home Congregation. He chaired the Judicial Committee that disfellowshiped BCH again in 2003 for lying. Mr. Penchev will give evidence that he was not aware of any reason to restrict BCH's contact with children at the time BCH joined the Logan Home Congregation, and that he only became aware of BCH's abuse allegations when criminal proceedings were brought against him between about 2001 and 2004. The Mariba Congregation recommended certain restrictions be placed on BCH due to the gravity of the wrongs committed but did not recommend any restrictions regarding BCH's exposure to children. Mr. Toole will give evidence that in January 2003, he provided a memorandum to the service desk, which observed that the primary issue before the Logan Home Judicial Committee in 2003 was BCH's lying, as opposed to his, his sexual abuse of BCG. In about 2001, criminal proceedings commenced against BCH for child sexual abuse and in 2004, he was convicted and sentenced to three years imprisonment. The Royal Commission will hear evidence from Jason Davies, a former Queensland DPP solicitor, regarding his involvement in the prosecution of the criminal proceedings against BCH. Mr. Davies will give evidence of his observations of the influence of the Jehovah's Witness faith on the behavior of those involved in the criminal proceedings. Mr. Davies' evidence will be that masses of faith sometimes take precedence over secular moral obligations and norms, and that the religious persuasion of those involved in the criminal proceedings was integral to understanding the behavior of the accused, the victim, and the witnesses, at least in their reluctance to go to the police. The Royal Commission will hear that the delay between the child sexual abuse and the time at which allegations came to police attention is in part attributable to the Church's practice of dealing with offending internally in accordance with its theocratic rules without referring matters to secular authorities. The Royal Commission will hear of the repeated applications for reinstatement made by BCH following his release from prison and of the factors taken into consideration by the Jehovah's Witness Church in considering these applications. The Royal Commission will hear evidence of the involvement of the Church's service desk in guiding the consideration 
of BCH's pleas for reinstatement. Mr. O'Brien will give evidence that to date he is unaware of any claims for redress having been made in relation to child sexual abuse concerning the Jehovah's Witnesses in Australia. Watchtower Australia does not hold any insurance policy which provides cover for any claims relating to child sexual abuse. Documents will be tendered which show that in 2008, Watchtower Australia considered the formation of a separate legal entity, apparently for the purposes of minimizing liability in the case of litigation. It is expected that the case study will provide the Royal Commission with insights into systemic issues within its terms of reference in the area of institutional responses to concerns and allegations about incidents of child sexual abuse. In particular, the systemic issues that are expected to be considered arising from this case study are the following. <clears throat> One, the influence of theocratic beliefs on the way in which religious institutions handle complaints and manage the risk of child sexual abuse and their interaction with government authorities. Two, the management of complaints of allegations of child sexual abuse within an institution without reference to external authorities and the impact that that approach may have on the institution's capacity to protect children. Three, the impact of an institution's internal disciplinary mechanisms on criminal processes. Four, the impact of the record-keeping practices of institutions on the ability of those institutions to manage the risk of child sexual abuse and to respond to victims of abuse. Five, the efficacy of mechanisms to prevent child sexual abuse. And six, the adequacy of systems to support and rehabilitate survivors of child sexual abuse. This uh, public hearing of the Royal Commission has been listed, obviously commencing today and uh, until Friday, the 7th of August. Yes, <coughs> thank you, Mr. Stewart. I think we might take the short adjournment now so that the cameras can be reorganised. Everyone, we'll adjourn. We'll stand.